The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, The Sugar Swindler. Every year in every state in the Union, Americans are swindled out of millions of dollars by confidence men. And it appears from the current files of your FBI that 1946 will prove to be no exception. There are just enough among us in both high and low estates who are looking for something for nothing. And because of that, confidence men never lack a ready market. Indeed, no axiom was ever truer than the motto of the swindler. The motto he uses as a yardstick when measuring potential victims. That axiom is, you can't cheat a careful man who checks before he acts. The night's file opens in a small apartment located in a residential section of an eastern city. It is early evening. The occupants of this modest flat, a newly married couple named Martin, are entertaining a dinner guest. Mr. Hanover? Ah, uh, yes, my dear? Would you like another piece of cake? Indeed I would, young lady. It's simply delicious. Oh, really? I, I could give you the recipe if you'd like it. Well, I... Uh... She's recipe happy, Mr. Hanover. She thinks everyone should collect them. Oh, <laughs> now, Eddie. <laughs> it's a fact. You clip out everyone you see. Why, she's got books full of them. Well, if they all turn out like this, you should consider yourself a very fortunate young man. Oh, gee, that's so nice to hear. You know something, Mr. Hanover? Yes? I can tell you now. I I was awful nervous about you coming here to dinner. Nervous? Well, why? Well, Eddie told me all about you. What a successful man you are. I was just scared. Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, I couldn't help it, especially when I knew you were coming here tonight to talk to Eddie about his going to work for you. Kay. Well, that's what you told me, wasn't it? Look, Mr. Hanover, all I said was that you looked me up when you came into town because you'd heard I knew something about the business. But, Eddie, I... Now, 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 just a minute, both of you. There's been no harm done. As a matter of fact, I'm quite anxious to talk to Eddie about his working for me. Really? Uh, yes. So perhaps you can tell me something about your past experience, uh, what you've done? Well, I've stolen about a half a dozen cars. Yes. Stuck up a couple of grocery stores. Mm-hmm. Rolled a few drunks. And don't forget to tell about the checks, Eddie. Oh, yes, I've I've kited some checks. Any police record? Oh, no, no. Oh, he's really been very careful, Mr. Hanover. Well, that's a fairly diversified background, but uh, to be frank with you, I'm rather disappointed. Oh, goodness, why? A man with your husband's appearance, manner, speech, uh, should be operating on a much higher level, my dear. Well, for heaven's sakes, he's just getting started. I think for the length of time he's been in the business, he's made wonderful strides. Kay, please. Well, I mean it. Look. Mr. Hanover, what sort of man did you have in mind? Well, um, I'll give you a brief sketch of the operation I'm planning here. I think that'll explain everything. Okay. When I arrived in town, I secured guest privileges at the Fairhaven Club. I'm uh, living there. Oh, is that the swanky place out in Lake Road? Uh, yes. Most of the club members are very wealthy businessmen. And businessmen these days are in a great deal of trouble with shortages. Oh. 
I circulate around the club until I find one individual who is so annoyed at the shortages that he's willing to go to any length to get what he needs. You mean an honest guy with just a little touch of larceny, huh? Exactly. And I'm happy to say that I have found such a gentleman. Oh, gee, you work fast. His name is Bristol. He's in the candy business and greatly in need of sugar. Which you, of course, will get for him. Uh, naturally. Well, that's just the preamble. The rest is quite intricate. I uh, won't touch on it now. Gee, I've always wanted Eddie to get into something high class like that. Little lady, I think your wish can be granted. You mean you want him to work for you? Yes, oh. I think he will qualify. Thanks, Mr. Hanover. I have an engagement tomorrow to play croquet with Mr. Bristol at the club. I hope to put the hooks into the old boy then. If I am successful, your new career begins. Good shot, Mr. Bristol. Right through both wickets. Just lucky, that's all. Nothing of the sort. I've been watching that swing of yours. You play a slashing game. Uh, get out here often, do you? Every day. Well, no wonder. I've got nothing else to do. No use going to the office. Uh, why not? Can't get the stuff to make anything with. Uh, what is your business, Mr. Bristol? Candy. What's your problem? Sugar. Can't get any. Well, that's too bad. <coughs> well played. Thank you. I suppose, Mr. Bristol, you've been approached like all of us have on undercover propositions? What do you mean? Uh, being offered, uh, say, sugar by an illegitimate source? No, no, I haven't. Well, you're lucky. I've been bothered to death by them. Uh, just got a letter this morning, as a matter of fact. What about? Uh, from an old employee of mine who went into the army. Uh, still in, as a matter of fact. He's the captain in the quartermaster corps. Yes? Uh, well, here's the letter right here. He's listed a hundred items that he can get for me. Well, how? He's stealing them from the army. How else? Now, my first inclination was to report him. Then I decided, why become involved in some long, drawn-out mess? So, uh, I'm just forgetting about it. What are you doing? Tearing up the letter. There. Uh, your shot, Mr. Bristol. Do you think a fellow like that can deliver? I know he can. Well, how? I know some people who already done business with him. Frankly, I think it's pretty awful. Oh, of course, of course. Probably even had sugar on his list, huh? Uh, yes, he did. I noticed it. Surely you weren't interested, Mr. Bristol. I should say not. Bully for you. Uh, make your shot. Very well. Oh, that was a pippin. <laughs> Mr. Hanover. Yes, my dear. Don't you think that Eddie should be getting home here soon? Now, just relax, child. I'm sure that everything is going fine. I hope so. Well, if you'd seen how anxious Mr. Bristol was to do business, there'd be no doubt in your mind. I wish I could get something straight in my head. Oh, yes? Well, uh, what's that? Why did Eddie have to wear that captain's uniform? I'll try to explain it once more. Mr. Bristol thinks that Eddie is a captain in the army. How did he know to call Eddie here? Because this phone number was in that letter. But you said you tore the letter up. I did. But Bristol went back there after our game was over and picked up the pieces. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I wish you could have seen him last night, my dear, on his hands and knees in the dusk, lighting matches to find the missing pieces. <laughs> Do you think he'll really believe that Eddie can get him sugar? I'm positive. Good. Well, I guess I'll read some more recipes. Would you like to read some, too, Mr. Hanover? Not at the moment. Oh. Tell me, my dear. Yes? Were you ever in the profession? Oh, not really. I just did a little shoplifting. I wasn't good at it. I'd rather just stay home and be a housewife. I see. Is that you, Eddie? Yes, honey. Oh, gee, I'm glad you're here. I was awful worried. Well, there was nothing to worry about. Well, how did it go, son? Just fine, Mr. Hanover. Good. It all came off just as we planned. When did you promise him delivery? I said sometime around the end of the week. Did you agree on a price? Yes. $5,000. Splendid. Say, I just thought, where are you going to get the sugar? From a sand pit, my dear? Huh? Honey, the bags we deliver will be loaded with sand. Oh, gee. 
He won't be able to make much candy with that. Some two miles away from the Martins' apartment at the local field office of the FBI, Charles Hanover is also the center of attention. Could you tell me where I could find a Mr. Tom Walters? Why, I'm... Why, Jim Taylor, you old <laughs> son of a gun, how are you? Hello, Tom. When did you get in town? About an hour ago. You been assigned to this office? No, I'm on a traveling job. What's it about? Well, I just told the whole story to your agent in charge, and believe me, it doesn't make me a hero. Trouble, Jim? Complete and utter frustration. I've spent the last month being just one jump behind one of the cleverest swindlers in the business. Who is he? Well, he has about ten aliases. Harris, Howell, Hartford, you just take your pick. What's his pattern of operation, Jim? It's just the trouble. He has no set pattern. He's been using as many swindles as he has names. Now, most of them have been local police cases, but the last two fell within our jurisdiction. I see. There's only one consistent thing that he does. And what's that? He always double-crosses his confederates. He uses new ones on each job. Have you picked any of them up? Oh, yes, but that's never led us to the top. Do you think he's here in town? That's highly possible, yes. What's your lead? Well, he bought a plane ticket for here a week ago. I just uncovered that this morning. Well, Jim, if there's anything I can do to help, why, I you know... I think there is, Tom. You've been assigned to the case. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. What's our first move? Well, I think we should check all hotels, tourist camps, and rooming houses and give them the swindler's description. We have a good one on him. Does he work on any particular type of victim? Yes, businessmen usually. So let's say you alert the Better Business Bureau, too. Right. And look, Tom... I've struck out twice against this old boy. This time, I want to get a hit. Kay. Kay. Yes, Eddie? Haven't you finished packing yet? Everything but my recipes. Oh, now look, honey, you can't take all of them. We wouldn't have room for anything else. Oh, but I went to so much trouble getting them. Oh, come on, just take your favorites, huh? Mr. Hanover said we should be ready to move out of here this afternoon. I know. Eddie. Yes, hon? Did Mr. Hanover ever say how much he was paying you for this job? I know. Why? Well, it just seems to me that you're being just as smart in this thing as he is. <laughs> yes, but it was his idea. But if anything went wrong, you'd be the one who'd be in trouble. Oh, he'll give us a good deal. I'm not worried. He wants us to travel along with him, doesn't he? That must mean he's satisfied. Yes. I'll get it. Hello. Edward? Oh, hello, Mr. Hanover. Everything's set, my boy. Good. I've loaded all the sandbags into that vacant store on Front Street. Yes? I want you to call Mr. Bristol and have you meet him there no later than 3 o'clock. Yes, sir. Show him the bags, collect the 5000 and be sure he brings it in cash. Then give him the keys to the store and uh, blow. Where do I meet you? I've engaged a compartment for us on the 4 o'clock train to Pittsburgh. Meet me aboard the train with the money. What about the railroad tickets? I'll have your lovely bride pick them up at the station. They're in your name. Car 162, compartment D. Car 162, compartment D. Right. Are you all packed? Just about. Well, good luck, my boy. And good hunting. I thought you'd never come. How'd everything go? Not a hitch. Got the money? Here it is, baby. Five G's. Gosh. Where's Mr. Hanover? I don't know, but you know what, Eddie? What? There's something funny going on about him. What do you mean? Well, I called the club where he was staying at just before I picked up the train tickets. Uh-huh. Now, I was anxious to know if he'd heard anything about you. Yes? They told me that he'd checked out and gone to the airport. The airport? Yes. They said he'd send his baggage out there, too. You sure? I'm positive. And that is no. Well? When I picked up the tickets for this compartment, I asked if Mr. Hanover had ordered one for himself, and they said no. Say, that is funny. I- I've got a feeling he's trying to pull something. <laughs> now, look, what could he pull? I've got the money. Just the same, I've got a feeling. Oh, a woman's feeling. After all, just because he's a big shot crook, that doesn't say he's an honest man. Okay, I think... Yes? Open up, my boy. Oh, okay. Hi, Mr. Hanover. Well, I'm delighted to see that you're here safe and sound. 
I trust everything worked out well. I've got the money right here. Splendid, splendid. Uh, let me have it, please. Mr. Hannibal, where are your bags? Bags? Why, I gave them to a porter. Uh, they should be right along. Uh, let me have that money, son. I've got to go back in the station and wire a few hundred to a friend in distress before the train leaves. Don't you give it to him, Eddie. What is this? I've just got a feeling that if you leave this train with that money, you're not coming back. Now, my dear child, where would I go? To the airport. Airport? What for? Because that's where your bags are. Now, look, I have had enough of this nonsense. Give me that money. I'll give you your share of it. What? Don't you give him more than half, Eddie. I'm taking it all. Let go of that leave money. Leave him alone. Oh, no, no. Very well, then. Wait a minute. Put down that water jug. Just, just what I'm going to do. <sighs> now, Eddie... I think we'd better leave him here, and we'll go to the airport. We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, three questions and answers on education. First question. What are the future employment prospects for young men with engineering training? In some branches of engineering, it is true the supply of war-trained men is ample for some years to come. But in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, metallurgical and mining engineering, surveys show that there are plenty of opportunities for ambitious young men. On what are these forecasts based? They come from a memorandum recently prepared for equitable society representatives. This memorandum, covering 29 different industries and professions, was designed as a guide to parents who want to provide for their children's futures through an equitable educational fund. Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a life insurance plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for equitable society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. It summarizes the long-range opportunities in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative will be glad to show his copy to any sincerely interested parent. Get in touch with him tomorrow or call the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Sugar Swindler. With easy money flooding the American scene, swindlers are doing a bigger business than ever before. And their victims, as they have always been, are those whose greed overcomes their conscience. When there are human beings without greed, there will be no swindlers. But until that time, it's the business of your FBI to protect the American public from these unscrupulous criminals. Tonight's file continues in the local field office of the FBI. Special Agents Taylor and Walters have been listening for some time to the testimony of the irate and indignant victim, Mr. Bristol. And so, gentlemen, I place the entire matter in your hands. I want these men apprehended, and I want my money returned. Mr. Bristol. Yes? I gather from what you've told us that when you made this deal with the bogus army captain, you were fully aware that this alleged sugar that you were buying was being stolen from the United States Army. I didn't question where it was coming but from. But you must have assumed that it was government property. I don't see what that has to do with getting my money back. It has nothing to do with it. 
But in my opinion, you deserve to lose it. Now, see here, that, I don't... That, however, is purely a personal opinion. It is still the duty of the FBI to recover that $5,000 and apprehend the criminals. Oh, Jim. Yes, Tom. From the description of this man Hanover, I would certainly think he was the man you came here to find. Well, there's no doubt about that. Mr. Bristol, you say this man was a guest at your club? He was living there, yes, but I told you he's already checked out. Tom, will you call the club, see if they have any further information on him, please? Right. Thanks. Sand. $5,000 worth of sand. Mr. Bristol, you say you telephoned the bogus captain? That's right. Where did you get that phone number? It was in a letter that Mr. Hanover... that he gave me to read. I see. Was there anyone else in on the deal? No one that I met. But when I first called the captain, the young woman answered the phone. Well, may I have that number, please? Yes, yes, I, I've got it right here. There you are. Thank you. I will have this traced and get the address. I doubt, however, if we'll find anyone living there. Young man, it seems to me we're wasting time. All these petty details. Those crooks have left town. I demand more action. Get your nationwide force behind this thing. Hanover's bags weren't sent out to the airport, Chief. I see. Well, we'll contact them out there and try to learn which flight he took. Mr. Taylor, if you don't take more direct action, I'm going to pass this matter on to someone higher up. Mr. Bristol, that's just what I intend to have you do. Because of your complicity in this case, the facts will be presented to the United States Attorney for his consideration on possible charges of your conspiring to defraud the government. <laughs> Good to be unpacked and settled again. You like the place, honey? Mm, I love it. Gee, just think a, a cottage all to ourselves. What made you decide to come here to Cincinnati? Well, I won a big bet once on their ball club, the Cincinnati Reds. I figured the place would be lucky. Oh. You know something, Eddie? What, honey? We should be real thankful that Mr. Hanover did try to double-cross us. You might have just gone on with him doing all the work and getting none of the glory. Yeah, that's right. Now you know how to swindle people, and you can do it all on your own. Gee, I don't know, baby. It's kind of a big order. Oh, you can do it, Eddie. I know you can. You mean the part of it that Mr. Hanover did? Of course. And, and you hire somebody to make out he's the captain. Well... Look, first thing in the morning, uh, uh, you're going to go out and join a country club. Uh, after all, there must be sand in Cincinnati, too. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Tim. I live going all right. There are no personal possessions around here anyplace. That looks like a closet over there. I'll take a look at it. The superintendent said they rented this place furnished, didn't he? Yes. Well, there's nothing in here. Well, we've got a pretty good description of the couple. Super said they didn't have a car, so we'd better check airlines, train, and bus terminals to see if we can determine where they've gone. Well, I hope we have more luck with them than we did with Hanover. So do I. I still can't figure why he checked his bags at the airport and then never showed up for his flight. No, I don't get that either. I don't think it's possible wait, that wait he could Wait a minute, Tom. What have you got? A stack of old magazines here. I, I was just scanning through a couple of them. Well? They may be a big help to us. Really? Yes. Yes, in fact, they might tell us where the young couple has gone. <laughs> Be the groceries. Answer it, will you, Eddie? Sure. Greetings, Edward. Mr. Hanover. That's right. I have a gun here, young man, and I imagine that's sufficient persuasion for you to ask me in. Yeah, good. Is that the groceries, Eddie? No. Mr. Hanover. What? How did you find us here? Well, it really wasn't too difficult. After I recovered from the little treatment you gave me, I got off the train at the first stop and called the airport. I uh, figured you might seek a quicker means to get out of town. So? They informed me that a couple answering your description had just boarded a plane to Cincinnati. They had no right to tell you that. How did you know where we were living? Oh, that was elementary. I knew that once you had learned the technique of the swindle, you would never be content to go back to stealing cars. 
I also knew you'd attempt to follow my pattern of operation. Yeah? So I called several country clubs, and one of them told me you'd apply it for membership. They gave me your address, and here I am. Well, you're not welcome, so please leave. My dear child, I've come here for a specific purpose, namely my $5,000. And I might add, I will use this gun if necessary to regain my money. Eddie, he's holding us up. Uh, young man, give me the money at once. But I get it, I said. Oh, you'd better do as he says. Uh, wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm wearing a money belt. The dough is in it. Just taking it off. Oh. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Now we'll see how much you've spent. There's $4,700 left. Well, I must commend you on your conservative spending. Are you going to keep it all? Definitely, my dear. Well, uh, now I must be going. Thanks again for taking such good care of my money. Good day. Good day. All right, stay where you are. Uh, what? <laughs> I hadn't hoped to find you here too, Hanover. Uh, who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Did you say FBI? That's right, young lady. How did you find us, too? Well, I can thank your recipe collecting for that. I alerted all the magazines you've been reading, and when you wrote into them from this address, that was all I needed. You and your recipe. <laughs> Charles Hanover was found guilty in a federal court and is now serving a long term in prison. Eddie Martin was convicted of impersonating an army officer and is serving a four-year term in a federal penitentiary. For her part in the crime, Mrs. Martin, after serving one year, was placed on probation. More than 97% of all suspects arrested by the FBI and taken to court are found guilty. That record is no accident. Because, as proven by tonight's file, your FBI does not pick a suspect at random and then swoop down to make a fast arrest. Instead, it works slowly and surely, sifting every available clue, following every lead until it has encircled the criminal in a ring of evidence from which there is no escape. Then, and only then, does it strike. And then it strikes swiftly to protect you, the American public. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children, an Equitable Educational Fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or call the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Big Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Big Shakedown, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.